Hello and welcome to another Salt and Light curriculum video. My name is Christina Admiston and I am a minister joining you today from Kitchener, Ontario in Canada. I also have a background in law. So as you can imagine, I am particularly excited to journey along with you during this next month as you lead your people through Unit 2 of the Salt and Light Fall Curriculum, which is all about justice, and in particular, justice for the widow, orphan, and stranger. My goal over the next month is to share some thoughts, perspectives, questions, and other resources that I hope may complement the written materials and encourage you to lead in ways that help the rubber hit the road, so to speak, for your participants. So let's jump in. The first session of Unit 2, which is Week 5. Since this is the first day of a new unit and a new topic, you may want to open by leading a broader conversation about justice. What is justice? When we say that someone or something is just, what exactly do we mean? If I were leading a group, I might invite people to break into smaller groups of two or three, just for a few minutes, and talk with one another to generate some ideas before bringing everyone back to the main group. Or, instead, in the larger group, invite people to call out one word or phrase that they think of when they think of justice, and then write these down. Your group may well find that justice is a difficult thing to define, and that coming to just one definition is challenging. In our society, systems of laws and courts, and especially in the criminal justice system, the definition of justice is typically based on the idea of retributive justice. In other words, the idea that people get the treatment they deserve. In a kind of blunt way, the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, gives you the idea of what retributive justice means. And for many folks, this is what we think of first when we think of justice. Justice can also be distributive, which means it concerns the division of property and who gets what. Justice can be procedural, determining how fairly people are treated. And justice can also be restorative. This kind of justice is concerned with the rehabilitation of the person who's broken the law and the reestablishment of right relationships between the offender and the victim or the offender and the community. Attempts at restorative justice have become more prevalent, at least in Canada where I'm, where I'm at, in the last 10 to 20 years or so. Some of you may be familiar with organizations in your community that lead groups or circles that focus on restorative justice. And if you're not familiar with any of those, you may want to look into that. As you move forward in the unit, it may be interesting for your group to keep their initial thoughts about justice in mind and then later compare those to the kinds of justice we will see represented in the texts, especially as your group reads the text and considers what God's justice looks like. Is God's justice retributive, procedural, restorative, or is it something else altogether? As I read the text for today's lesson, specifically, I am struck by how compassion and mercy for the poor figure into God's justice model. This is especially so in the text from Exodus. Now, when I think of the justice systems of our world, compassion is certainly not the first thing that comes to mind. But here in Exodus, we have clear guidance on the importance of compassion in just dealings with others. In fact, God's justice model here required lenders to be aware of the economic status of the people they were lending to and to kind of bend the law, forego their own rights and make concessions if those people were poor. So you see in verse 26, they need to not only pay for the coat that was pawned, but then 
return the coat as well. This was, of course, different from what people with means would have been accustomed to. If someone sells you their coat and you pay good money for it, you're entitled to keep it, right? And it's none of your business, really, whether that's their only coat. It's not your responsibility to ensure they stay warm. A deal is a deal. But the model of justice in Exodus gives those who are economically privileged a responsibility not only to be aware of the financial circumstances of the folks they have dealings with, but also to ensure the poor have their minimum material needs met, and certainly not to profit from their poverty. There is a kind of preferential treatment for the marginalized in God's justice model, or put another way, God expects God's people to be deeply aware of economic inequalities as they deal with one another. And God requires the wealthy to be regularly giving more in an ongoing attempt to balance out the inequities in society. This mode of divine justice is reflected in the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels and the writings that came after, of course, because these are the laws that guided the community that Jesus belonged to, and he would have been formed by them. In the text from James chapter 2, this approach finds its way in. The text isn't about just dealings. Specifically, it is coming from a different angle. It's about how faith and works relate to one another in the life of a believer. But we can see this thread that weaves through that true faith leads to compassion and care for the material needs of the poor. Those who declare faith in God should also be moved by what moves that God. True devotion to God and God's ways must mean believers share God's special concern for the practical needs of the marginalized. So, compassion. Justice and compassion are twins in today's text. Which leads me to a more practical question. How do we encourage greater compassion? How do we open not only our minds to these ideas, but our hearts wider and wider to the concerns of the marginalized? Well, prayer is one thing that this resource recommends. Only God can change hearts. And as we pray for someone on an ongoing basis, our hearts are softened towards them. If I were leading a group, I'd probably leave time for praying together. Another thing that opens hearts is relationships and stories. We are much more understanding towards a group of folks when we have friends among them. Some of you may be teaching a group that is very diverse in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds and situations. You may have folks who have experienced or are experiencing poverty or homelessness, who may be ready and willing to share some of their story. The resources also recommend that group participants might share stories of their encounters with folks experiencing homelessness or poverty, and that could also be very enriching. One other resource I'd recommend is a channel on YouTube called Soft White Underbelly, it's a channel by photographer Mark Leita, who interviews individuals who live on the margins of society in a variety of ways. Many of them live in the Skid Row neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. I've learned so much and have gained so much more understanding by regularly watching these interviews. There are dozens of them. Not all of them might be appropriate to recommend to your group, but you could choose one or two and either share a clip during a lesson or recommend them to your group participants to watch on their own time. And if you don't use that resource this week, it may well come in handy later on in the month. You've taken on such an important task in bringing these texts and topics to the people you are leading. I really hope these few minutes have been helpful and an encouragement to you. May God give you wisdom and joy as you prepare and lead. See you next week.